Good morning and happy Thursday, everyone. Um, we are in the continued virtual world and we're happy to provide a virtual cafe. Um, we hope that you're sitting uh, comfortably. You may or may not be wearing pajama bottoms. Uh, there's no way for us to tell. All we can see is each other's faces. So for us, it's going to be a relatively informal conversation where we're happy to invite you in and to pull up a seat really to really understand what uh, life on the, on the quote unquote front lines of providing children's mental health care looks like, especially in the pandemic. Um, I'll introduce myself. My name is Andrew Tischler. I am the Director of Impact Consulting Services at Capitalize for Kids. Um, and I hope that you hear as little as, of me as possible. What the aspiration is for today and the intention is to allow you, the viewers and participants, to really hear from our terrific panel of people who are present today and are leaders of their own separate organizations that do provide kids mental health care. I'll hand it over to them shortly just so that they can introduce themselves a little bit. And I want to just uh, kick off what, uh, what we are looking at today. Um, in the previous episode of our virtual cafe, we took the 30,000 foot view of what the kids' mental health care uh, landscape looks like, particularly in the time of COVID. For today, we're very fortunate to really dive into the weeds or, or dolphin from 30,000 right down to the, the, the brass tacks and hear how things are looking uh, day to day, and also how we're getting a chance to work as Capitalize for Kids with each of the organizations. I'd like to invite everybody to become part of the conversation, and there is a Q&A area for, where you can enter any of your questions. We invite you to put those in uh, as soon as anything comes to mind, as well as any thoughts about any other things you'd like us to do in future virtual cafes, given what you've heard today. Um, if you'd like me to speak more quickly or more slowly, we're also happy to have any sort of commentary around that. That being said, um, very good to meet you all. We welcome you to this informal cafe, and I'd like to uh, begin by handing it over to Carol Beauchamp, who is the Executive Director of Rebound Child and Youth Services, to introduce herself and her organization. Uh, Carol, if you'd like to uh, introduce yourself to the, uh, the group. Hi everyone, uh, thank you Andrew. Uh, so as Andrew said, I'm Carol Beauchamp. I am the Executive Director of Rebound Child and Youth Services and Rebound Child and Youth Services is located in Northumberland County, which is approximately 120 kilometers east of Toronto. Um, Northumberland County is a fairly rural uh, community. And um, one of the things that we are impacted by in our community is poverty with one in five people throughout Northumberland County um, living in poverty. And that has a significant an impact on mental health. So uh, Rebound Child and Youth Services has been um, uh, around since 1997 and we came out of the, the field of youth justice where we were really helping uh, young people that were, came into conflict with the law and in 1997 um, most of our clients were from that, that source. In 2005, we uh, started providing mental health because we really started to see the correlation with young people entering the youth justice system and mental health because pretty much 100% of the youth that became in conflict with the law had mental health issues. So in 2005, we, we started mental health services. And at that time, 12% of our clients um, received mental health services. In 2018, we made a significant shift to really expand our mental health services. And today, 77% of our clients receive mental health services. So that's 77% of all the clients we, we, we serve um, are mental health clients. And, and there's been a number of demographic shifts in, 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 in the, what we're seeing in the presentations. You know, initially, mo the majority of our clients, so 90% of our clients were over at the age of 12. Now, 40% of our clients are under the age of 12. And that's a, a really significant shift in what we're seeing. And we're seeing that, I think the other panelists will agree, younger and younger children are suffering from mental health issues. Um, at Rebound, we take an upstream approach. So that is really trying to address things as early as possible. We believe truly that the earlier we can intervene and the earlier we can provide the services, the better the outcomes for the young person in the long term. And that's, that's really what we're striving to do. And working with Capitalize for Kids is really enabling us, even as we're entering into this project, it's enabling us to start to work better. 
um, you know, we're seeing increasing complexity. So whereas at one time we, we only served 60 youth um, with one-to-one -one services, you know, of the 981 clients that we served with mental health, 324 of those young people had significant issues and re required much more intensive services. So when I talk about acuity or complexity, there's not just one thing happening in their world. Um, you know, they may come in and be expressing anxiety, but then we find out they're on the autism spectrum disorder and they may be living in precarious housing situation, which all has impacts on their mental health, or they may have trauma um, because we live in a, a community where a number of people all, um, are First Nations and Indigenous. So there's that intergenerational trauma thing. We at Rebound take a very holistic approach to how we approach um, um, working with the, the children because we think the families are a big part of their support because mental health and mental wellness begins at home. So we, we support the families too. And that's, again, something we're being able to do and we're really being able to analyze the way we work so that we can support that in a more functional and better way. Now, Andrew, I don't know how I'm doing on time. So I just wanna be mindful if, I'm, if I've run out of my three minutes because I don't want to waffle too long. Thanks very much for that and appreciate you being the first person to, to take this step and dive in and to introduce yourself. I, I think that's a, a great introduction, a very nice overview, and thanks for, for bringing in how Capitalize for Kids is working with you. Um, I think we can certainly circle back and thanks for being mindful of the time. Um, with that being said, I'm happy to introduce then uh, Darsha who will follow up uh, and is uh, from Firefly, is another uh, client that we're uh, working with and who's a beneficiary of all the generosity that all the, um, the donors and do people who become from different foundations individually and so on uh, to really help provide more kids mental health care and, uh, and services. So with that, maybe Darsha, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself and who Firefly is. Sure, thank you so much, Andrew. Uh, and thank you to Capitalize for Kids for the invitation to join in on this panel. So my name is Darsha Curtis, as Andrew said, and I'm the Director of Service Excellence and Partnerships at Firefly. So Firefly is a unique multi-service children's service agency located up in the north, uh, the far northwest. Uh, Firefly services include early on autism services, infant and child development, child care, diagnostic services, and we have a strong rehab team. So we are a new uh, children's treatment center offering speech and language pathology, occupational therapy, physiotherapy, and we are the lead agency for coordinated service planning. And of course, uh, one of the reasons we are here today, uh, we are also the, we offer centralized intake and we are one of the lead agencies for child and youth mental health services in the province. Our central office is located in Kenora, Ontario. So way up on the border, uh, only two hours away from Winnipeg and I think six hours away from Thunder Bay. So far away from possibly many that are on this call. Um, we are on the beautiful shores of Lake of the Woods and we have six additional offices across the Kenora and Rainy River District located in Red Lake, Ear Falls, Dryden, Sioux Lookout, Fort Francis and Atacokan. Firefly is a very proud and progressive history with over 40 years of uh, deep roots in the delivery of, delivery of quality services for children and youth and families in our communities and uh, support many partnerships in our area. Today, we are the leading provider of mainstream children's services in the area with over 200 staff serving in communities across the Kenora and Rainy River District and in partnership with our Indigenous uh, partners. Uh, we, offer off, we offer services in the far north fly-in First Nation communities. Our mental health team has about 35 members throughout the region, and we provide a range of core services, including brief service, counseling and therapy, family and caregiver services, psychological services, psychiatry, youth justice, and SNAP. In 2020, our team serviced upwards of 500 unique clients. Our centralized intake program processes referrals for a wide range of voluntary children's services throughout the Kenora and Rainy River District as well. Um, and in 2020, centralized intake served uh, 1,414 unique clients. So that's my introduction, Andrew, and I'll pass it back to you. Thanks for that, Darsha. Um, and again, we, we really want to make just, it's, it's obviously going to be very much a, an informative piece. Here's a little bit of data. Here's a high level overview of each of the organizations. 
And if anybody wants to find out any more about all of the organizations with whom we're speaking or anyone individually, feel free to type in in the Q&A and we're happy to answer anything or make any connections that you think might be of benefit, or we can ask anything that you would like to know um, individually. Um, with that being said, thanks again, Darsha, for the introduction. I'm very happy then to invite Suzanne Clements to tell us about uh, her organization, YouthLink, uh, and about herself and uh, the organization itself as well. Uh, so Suzanne, if you're ready, we'd love to hear from you. Yes, thanks, Andrew. And thank you to Capitalize for Kids for inviting us. Um, we're very happy to be here. I'm happy to be here. I'm the uh, clinical director at YouthLink. Um, I have a background in marriage and family therapy, as well as trauma therapy and um, individual counseling. And so YouthLink is a medium-sized not-for-profit agency, and it's based out of Scarborough. It has a very old and very cool history. Um, YouthLink has been around since 1914, and uh, it is the former Big Sisters Association of Metropolitan Toronto. Throughout many years of evolving and numerous changes, uh, the agency expanded so that it services all youth, not just female youth. So currently we are an accredited agency through the Canadian Centre for Accreditation with our core services serving youth age 12 to 21. Now that being said, our core services work um, our core services work is uh, child and youth mental health. So we offer programs uh, for counseling and currently in the process of expanding, we always had um, ongoing counseling services available. In 2016, we expanded to offer uh, what's up walk-in five days a week. Initially, it started as a pilot one day a week. Um, that's a single session process where um, youth or parents can uh, attend for assistance in relation to their uh, whatever's happening or they and they can attend together as well. Um, that program actually is from zero to 24 and we continue to press onward in relation to expanding that youth age range because we all know through brain science now that uh, youth at age 18 is is not uh, not what should I say um, well, there's, there's still youth after 18, they're still developing. So um, right now we're implementing brief services, which is going to entail and hopefully roll out December 1st, um, where there's, it's going to be something called uh, short-term treatment. And that's uh, three to four family sessions where the entire family attends, as well as brief services, which is three to eight sessions for youth individually. Um, in addition to that, then our ongoing counseling services and we'll figure out which program matches the client most uh, effectively. Um, so we also have like drop-in support. All of, our, all of our services for young people are free. Uh, we do other things as well. We run a, sh a youth shelter. The shelter has uh, 51 beds in total. 10 are emergency shelter beds and 41 are for uh, transitional youth. They can stay there up to the age of 24 and the stay is uh, one to two years. Uh, we also have a residential treatment center uh, that youth uh, stay for up to a year in-home family supports where we have outreach workers who go into the family to do in more intensive work and we have educational supports. Some of the numbers in relation to those for What's Up Walk-In, which right now we call it What's Up Talk-In. <laughs> um, last year we served 524 clients. There was a total of 791 sessions for the year. Um, our ongoing counseling did over 2000 hours of therapy. Our intensive in-home services serviced approximately 190 families. Our education process, which is, it's called Pathways. It's an educational pathway to help youth graduate. Um, was, there was 280 students involved. And we had 81 youth actually access our emergency shelter during the past fiscal year, 52 of those 
accessed uh, transitional housing program after that. And then we assisted 36 youth to move uh, from the transitional housing into their own permanent housing. And we had 15 youth in our residential treatment center. So the truth of the matter is, uh, so much of what young people need is about healing from the things that have already happened to them in their lives. And YouthLink provides services to assist youth with a safe environment to heal, whether that's on an outpatient basis, an inpatient basis, or a housing situation. That's about all I have for, to tell you. <laughs> it's plenty, definitely. Uh, so now to really reinforce the idea of it being informal, I, I just want to invite all three speakers who've done very, very well speaking into the, the black of not knowing who we're speaking to. We can take a deep breath now. We, we've, you've all acquitted yourselves extremely well to introduce who you are and make sure that people know the, the swath of services that you offer across the province in the various areas that you are. Um, clearly, you're, especially in the time of COVID and everything, you, you've done very well to help hundreds of people, if not thousands, collectively, certainly. And we're looking to help you see and do more of that. Um, I'm really curious. I, I'm sure that each one of you, you don't exactly know what the projects are that are running with each of your organizations. I'll tip my hand a little bit. We tend to like to focus on data first, um, which is you know, that which can be measured can be changed, I think is really a, an ethos or a mantra, which makes a lot of sense to me. As we've begun working together individually, and, and feel free to go popcorn style, I guess, um, have you found that the way that we're looking to engage with data with each of you has changed a little bit? Because I know you had certain reporting requirements and you had reams of data that, you, that was due to the government and so on. Do you find that we're using data differently? Are we pulling different data? Is it giving you a different view about your operation overall? Is, is that something that you're finding to be useful and do you want to just uh, discuss? I'd be happy to hear your reflections on that. I don't mind chiming in first, if you, if you like. Um, I, I think one of the things that's really interesting, so we Rebound is a very small organization and, and small but mighty. Um, we, as I mentioned, we served last year 1,270 clients, but we, we have 13 staff. So, so we are doing a huge amount of work with fairly limited resources, but having this opportunity to work on the data. So there's a couple of different things I will say. We could not possibly in a million years afford the services that we are being afforded by Capitalize for Kids. So it's 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 wonderful. And we are, we've not, our project is underway, not completed. And one of the things that's really exciting is, is even being asked the right questions. As a leader of the, an organization, I'm being asked questions that force me to look differently at things. So as we're looking at the data and we're looking at the organization, we're starting to find, uh, and I'm going to give you an example, we have a, an assessment tool that we use. And I was asked, well, you know, how, how many, you know, what percentage of these um, assessments are completed? And I said, that's a really good question. I, I will find that out for you. And by asking that question, I found out, ah, our completion rate was, um, not that high. And I thought, all right, well, now I need to start asking more questions. Why isn't it high? More questions. So then I actually discovered that there was, there was a, a disconnect with the, the assessment tool and what was happening and the front level. By being able to correct that, by being aware that the, the percentage of completion rates wasn't that high, we've been able to do a training with our staff. They have been able to use the tool so much more effectively which is actually creating better client outcomes. In other words, they're having more success with their clients because they're being able to see the trajectory and the arc of the client's improvement through um, a, an objective assessment tool. So that's just one small example. And again, as a leader, I would love to be able to show you this beautiful dashboard I have in front of me. And I don't know if I can, but it's it's a snapshot. It's not live yet, but it's I, I, I literally just have a screenshot of it. But this gives me an at a view glance of what is happening in my organization. So even understanding when we have the majority, when we're serving the majority of our clients, 
um, that helps me pre-plan, you know, and do things like vacation times and stuff like that, which again, improves service to clients. So it helps us maximize how well we can serve clients because I've already alluded to the fact that working quickly um, and as early as possible with clients is, is really important. And that by being responsive, by being able to be very agile, and again, small community agency, we're very agile. So we can pivot quickly by finding, you know, seeing leading indicators, seeing trends, um, and being able to um, actualize that. So that's one answer. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a good one. Thank you for that. Um, what, what I'm hearing from you in that situation is that and this is my guess, I'd love to hear uh, each of your, Suzanne and Darsha's answer to the question about your, your, your approach or how the relationship to data has changed. One thing that comes to mind I'd love to dig into as well is the fact that um, here at Capitalize for Kids, I hope we've never presented ourselves as being people who are going to tell you how to give better mental health services. We're not qualified to do that. What we are able to do is really come at things with more of a management lens and put in more business processes um, where you might not, if I can be so bold as to say, any budget that each of your organizations has is to hire more clinicians who actually deliver mental health services. It's not people to make things run more efficiently or optimize. And having the money to be able to do that, as well as the people who have a business background, as well as our pro bono partners, McKinsey, Bain, BCG, Deloitte, to really supercharge that process, we believe, or we're telling ourselves, and I'd love to check with you on this, um, that we're, 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 it's like a puzzle piece that we can add to the table that you just don't have the resources for, or you don't know what you don't know because the management lens is something that's not really a priority. Um, having said all that, I, I don't know if I stepped on anything you wanted to say, Darsha or Suzanne, but I'd love to hear from either or both of you on that point. Well, yeah, as, as I was listening to you, it's, it's anyone that works in a nonprofit organization, um, you know, we don't really like to reveal that um, it's basically a fight to get technology for our organizations. Most of the time, we're so out of touch with tech solutions as well. Um, we don't even know what's possible. And of course, we want to run a professional organization that's efficient and effective. But because of our funders, um, often the focus is so much on services themselves, because we're facing constant pressure to keep the overhead low, like a uh, getting $50,000 to do software implementation is like completely unattainable. Um, everybody knows that to become more efficient, usually you need upfront investment. And that's been huge in relation to C4K because, you know, our agency, we don't even, we didn't, we didn't even really know what to look for. And that's really the irony of it. Um, we're under pressure to be efficient without the tools, the investment or the expertise to truly do so. And I think that that's the part that C4K um, brought to us. And if I speak to the data piece as well, initially our project was about an appointment reminder system. And um, initially when we were trying to tackle that, it was, it was a smaller tech project implementation, but that was really just to figure out, you know, A, how can we give more reminders? How can we, um, so that, you know, the clinicians aren't wasting their time in emailing and calling to make sure kids show up, that it could just be a system that sends the reminder and they can confirm that they're coming. But that was really about just really figuring out no-show rate. Um, and, and that's an important piece for us to know, like what is the no-show rate so that we can do things differently and help kids, whatever that is, so that they can show up. Um, when the pandemic hit, unfortunately, um, our small tech project turned into a much huger project and we came humbly to C4K and said, can you please assist us with something much bigger? So we now have the appointment reminder system plus a new entire electronic health record, which is awesome. But thanks very much for that. If, Darsh, if you don't mind, a, a quick thing, two, two things that came to mind. I mean, obviously, Please don't hold yourselves back from, from singing our praises. I'll never cut you off if you want to do that. But um, the fact that we're, we do see it like that, and, and I think it's one of the, the core elements of us, and this is in line very much with the question that we received online as you were speaking there. Um, only Because we only have people from Ontario for this particular panel, it doesn't mean that that's what we're constrained to. So just want to clarify that all of these solutions that you're going to hear about today are available throughout the country, and we're seeking to do it 
uh, ideally with francophone groups or working with a francophone group here in Ontario. Uh, we want to work with indigenous communities. So anything you hear about, please don't feel like it's only available, so on and so forth. Always reminded me when I lived in Quebec, available everywhere except Quebec always drove me crazy. But that, that's a whole separate thing I have to deal with myself. But yeah, absolutely. And the, to come back to your point, Suzanne, and maybe to tee you up here, Darsha, we, we see this rather than just being a one off, a hit, and then we leave you alone forever. It's more of us starting a relationship somewhere and we want to be alongside you so we don't just work with you for a couple of years and then you're dropped and left on your own to deal with things. And we want, if we do see an opportunity to get into bigger scope and scale, rather than resisting it, we're happy to do it. And I think we're, we're very uh, blessed, again, for the people who are listening, uh, who are either just generally uh, sponsors and people who donate or, and or have attended our, our conference in the finance space um, I think that we're really able to, to channel that towards actually helping organizations for a long-term relationship. And that's, I'm really happy to hear that that's how this one developed as well. Um, Darsha, I don't know if that's totally nothing to do with what you had in mind, but uh, thank you for waiting for a second. We'd love to hear from you if you had something to add there as well. Yeah, sure. No, great. Uh, just to share a little bit about my story in meeting Capitalize for Kids, I had newly transitioned actually to the sector. Uh, I was brand new to the sector. I'd worked 18 years in adult developmental services, um, but was new to the child and youth uh, mental health area and sector. And about six months into transitioning to my role, we were, we were in the midst of a pandemic and I was introduced to Capitalize for Kids. So it was a unique opportunity for me to be connected with them and, and to really all of us join together and have sort of an, a new insider view into the the world of child and youth mental health. So we were able to look through that lens. Um, and for us and for myself as, a, as the new director, I was really looking at um, the care pathways to service and the barriers that existed for children and youth to access services. And we really wanted to continue to improve our wait times. So when we met for with Capitalize for Kids, it really gave us that um, intersectoral sort of lens and approach that we, we would never have been able to have. Uh, again, I'm up in the, in the far north and we are traditionally just under-resourced, underfunded, um, specifically in our, in our mental health services, but across the healthcare sort of spectrum. So we had decided and worked together, having Clara come on with her, her data and her expertise, we just never would have been able to afford anything like that. And for all of us to sit around and sort of look at how our own internal processes were contributing to barriers of, uh, for accessing our services um, and, and looking to improve that. So what we ended up coming up with was a sort of very data-driven uh, informed decision making and, and processes and to look at sort of what may have appeared to be really an easy approach but has made such a significant improvement and that resulted in an online referral uh, that was that took a, much longer than you would think and I think without the advocacy the research that Clara and Andrew were able to do the questions they were able to ask us from, from that outside perspective, really drove uh, a referral form that was really well thought out um, and, and pre-planned. So again, I just, without that deep dive into our trends and uh, our numbers and the advocacy that they provided, we, we wouldn't be where we are. We set out with a goal to have something launched by March, 2020. Too, and we uh, were able to launch something in September, which has made a significant impact to youth being able to access our services on their own through an online referral. And we're seeing a number of children or youth uh, refer themselves, skip over a, a really long archaic process of, of intake that existed for our organization and still continues to exist for children and youth where they have to continue to share their story. They're now able to, from their classroom, from their home at night, from their phones at night, refer themselves and, and skip over that need to tell their story to someone that isn't their clinician. And it also, as Andrew mentioned, um, we have, we're very under-resourced and now our clinicians get to focus on that direct service. This would have been a project that we would have maybe been trying to do off the side of our desks and, and with their sort of expertise and commitment, uh, I, I thought it was kind of a gift early on, but then to just have them weekly, weekly with us um, going through the journey, uh, it, 
it's we, we wouldn't have been able to afford anything close to that. Thanks for that, Darsha. And, and truly, I mean, it's it's very nice. And uh, if we if I look at it, in fact, each of you is at a different stage of the relationship with Capitalize for Kids. I think Darsha and Firefly are the furthest along, uh, whereas I think Carol is at the point of just creating a dashboard. And, and I like the fact that it's something that you can actually see what's going on and what, where a potential problem is to ask the right questions. I, I loved it with Firefly. There was great internal discipline in terms of they had a very clear goal, but it was just unclear as to how to measure it and achieve it. So it was a good, and there was great patience, just the rigor, let's, let's test. Is it this channel that's the issue? Is it that one? Where do we find the problem? And we got an accurate diagnosis based on not just it feels like, it seems like, but rather the data tells us it is X, Y, and Z. And when, like with any of the clients that each of you is serving, providing a prescription without knowing the diagnosis you're very you're, you're lucky you have to buy a lottery ticket to, to see it actually works and i think the same process used for the treatment of children i think is one that each of you has really um just embraced in terms of how you can actually help your own organizations as well so really appreciate the just sharing of how it's gone very happy to see that it was and we're not simply about let's look at data but actually doing something with it so i think getting that link in place for darsha um in firefly it changes the lived experience of clients and, and removes days and weeks, if I'm not mistaken, in terms of the amount of time they were waiting for treatment, which anybody who's been suffering or knows a child who's been suffering knows that every hour a day can, can really matter. So we're very happy to hear that story and happy to go through. And I want to uh, congratulate the three of you as well. Your, your responses are really engendering a few uh, questions coming up from the group as well. Um, there's a question from, if I'm going to put it forward, if anybody wants the popcorn style answer, I haven't had a chance to pre-read it. So if it doesn't land for whatever reason, don't feel like you need to answer. But um, one of the questions is, uh, I'll read it verbatim. Um, there is a huge role for mental health literacy and enhancing capacity for youth mental health services. Um, any of these agencies using any literary agencies to this end? Is the question clear enough or did you want me to reread it or does anybody feel they want to engage right away? in terms of uh, enhancing health, mental health literacy, generally speaking? I think that's what the question's asking. And I, I, I don't necessarily have to wait. It's not like class where everybody, you just stare at people until they break down and give an answer. I'll let you think about that for a little bit. Um, if it resonates for you, you have an answer that you think you can provide, can definitely do that. For the uh, question that was answered, if something comes up later, we're happy to do things in writing form as well if it's not available currently. Um, there's another question that came up based on your responses, and thanks again. Uh, this is for Suzanne. Um, Suzanne, uh, can you speak about how your data collection, it, there's, a, there's a big data theme, of course, um, data collection, data definitions have changed as a result of your EHR implementation, electronic health record implementation, for those who don't know. Um, what will this do for YouthLink to inform future decision-making and improve services and client outcomes? To give you a moment to think on that, Suzanne, I'm gonna do a quick straw poll and work from Carol. Uh, sorry, you, you really do come across first given C and B, you, you can't escape it. Um, Suzanne, while you think on the question, I'm happy to repeat it a little bit later. If I could ask, generally speaking, um, it, for your organization, you have 13 people. How many people are dedicated to uh, business operations, data collection, and so on, if there are any, if you're willing to disclose it. If not, I, I'm happy to move on to Darsha as well. So in our organization, no one is 100% devoted to data collection and stuff because um, everybody, like as an ED, I would be involved in some of that. My receptionist is involved in some of that. So we, we it, it's parsed out because we don't have the luxury of anyone working 100% on that. And even some of our counselors have to do this. But by having the, the as we're building the system, um, it, it's becoming a lot easier for us. So we do have a, an EMR, we do have a, a client um, information system, and we're very fortunate because we did develop that some time ago. But now with Capitalize for Kids, we're able to, they're helping train our team to quickly extract information. And that's an important part. So there's two or three staff as part of their role, their frontline staff, but as part of their role, they're pulling and extracting information. So that, and that would include our receptionist. Yeah, so um, thank you for the answer. And my takeaway from it, if I, if I baseline, 
nobody's necessarily coming. You, you haven't hired for somebody to say, have you done four years in data management collection and science? It's off the side of the desk. You're a good soul. In addition to providing mental health services directly to clients, you're doing all sorts of data work above and beyond your job description. Not, not a judgment, but that tends to be what I, we come across in the field, frankly. I'm seeing nodding and you're very, very nice to accept what I'm saying. Yes, absolutely. YouthLink has no data person. It lands on the uh, desks of the directors. And um, it's, a, it's an interesting process because uh, previously, um, I can kind of tie this into the question that was asked. Okay. We had Excel scrapes sheets all over the place, collecting different data here, there, and everywhere. And there was nothing centralized. It was all, you know, you know, manual counting, even to be honest, which is kind of embarrassing, uh, you know, with our what's up walk and turned away clients was captured on pen and paper. <laughs> um, but now with the electronic health record that we have, the things that will be different is that, um, and we're right there, that's exactly where we're at right now, learning the reporting processes, um, what is that going to look like, getting the information system to give us the reports back that we're going to need. So we know that um, definitely our data is more accurate now. The system that we used before, we were getting numbers, we could pull the same report and get two different numbers and that in and of itself is a bit concerning and now that's not what what's happening um it's we have the system is like a one-stop shop so uh we're able to do the telehealth the appointment reminders assessment tools it's a communication portal for clients we review um reports, treatment plans, it has embedded outcome measures, which means we're going to know better uh, now whether young people's treatment plans are working or not. And everything's all in one place instead of having stressed out therapists trying to operate six to eight different platforms all at the same time and not know how to, you know, even get in with <laughs> the right password. And again, this is a, a thank you for that, Suzanne. And really, again, thank you all three for answering so with such transparency, you know, and um, it, it's one of those things that I believe is the case that in, in any, men, any mental health worker themselves has to have a mental health worker because the load that people carry from these interactions is pretty heavy. It, it, if it is needed, it should come from the interactions with people and not how do I manage this Excel form and this thing I've never done in my life and I don't care about. That's what's keeping me up at night and giving me a, a stress problem. Um, anything we can do to help alleviate that and that you're so willing to do it. A lot of people have this allergic reaction up front potentially to data. It's terrifying, so on and so forth. But with people, uh, I'm not going to say myself, but we have some great people on our team who are excellent with, with figuring out what's going on to help you uh, guide and go through that. Um, last but not least, I wanted to give Darsha a chance to engage on the same question if she wanted to. Um, just, you know, how much of a resource do you have available? I, I think Firefly is a little bit of an outlier on that, but I don't think there's a lot of, of money or resources available for that kind of thing. Yeah, no, Firefly does, we, we have a new data analyst now, very new. Uh, they joined our team around the same time that we started working with Capitalize for Kids. So Claire and Richard have been able to sort of work between each other. Claire has been really helpful and beneficial in sort of leading us around the types of data points we should be looking at and how to collect that. We do have a, a system, EMHware, and our organization does have a history of doing uh, working with Six Sigma and, and working on lean projects. So that is part of our culture here at Firefly. And again, though we were pulling clinicians off the front line that were offering direct services in order to, to run these programs or projects or initiatives. So having capitalized for kids come and, and, and the cost of lean projects is, is significant. Um, we have consultants helping us do that. So to be able to work on a project with capitalized for kids at no cost, um, is the benefit really. Sorry. I've, uh, yeah, my, 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 again, speaking of technology and data, my whole screen got minimized. So I'm sure I'm the only person in the past year and a half who's had to deal with either my screen went crazy or you're on mute. I don't know how many times I've had to deal with that. Fortunately, I just did. I just jinxed it, by the way. I, I'm de definitely going to happen to me once before this call ends. Um, Terrific answers. And thanks again, Darsha, for the engagement there as well. I think it's a share. This is one of those things, again, you're in a province that's 24 hours wide in terms of just driving and just the diversity of people you're engaging with. And yet there are systemic things where simply 
we don't want to take away uh, the time nor the people who are trained for delivering mental health care and force them to square peg in a round hole uh, to do things that they're willing to do but don't have the, the training for. It's not that they don't want to, but there are people who are trained and live to do that. And we'd like to bring that optic and lens. And we also, for those people who are donors who are listening, really seek to make it so that we can give back actual impact metrics to show a, a quote unquote ROI, if you will. Uh, you put a dollar in, how does this create impact? How many more kids potentially are being seen? How many, how many people are your dollars helping get things done with? And I think that's something that it's not that there's ill will from anybody in the community, correct me if I'm wrong, if anybody wants to put their hand up for that, I, I'd be surprised and, and tip my hat to you for the, 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 the nerve to say it, but um, it, it's really that there's just not the resource available to actually do that. Um, based on the great question, the answers you're given, there's another question that's come in online. I'll just read it verbatim. Thanks for answering the other one uh, so seamlessly, by the way, Suzanne. Um, it, it was asked here, it was mentioned that the quote unquote, the art of the possible isn't always known. Uh, how do you work each of your organizations with C4K on your technical project roadmap and setting priorities? I'm happy to reread or just give it a couple seconds as well, if anybody would. Like. I can answer that one. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it was so easy. It wasn't, it wasn't my responsibility. I was the point person, but um, the person that we worked with, her name was Annalise, and she basically managed the project. She set all the meetings, all the timelines. She kept us in line, accountable to get the system up and running. Normally, it would take about a year to do so. We ended up doing it in 10 months just because it was the pandemic and how important it was. And I had so much faith and trust in her. She's awesome. She was so good. And, you know, it would be a quick email. You haven't given me this yet. And it just kept going. And it was so smooth. Thanks for the testimonial, I'm sure. And I, I should mention again, I, thank you very much for mentioning people's names. Darsha mentioned Clara, Suzanne, you just mentioned, you know, Annalise. Uh, we have Scott on the team. Quentin, our managing director, leans in as well. We have Evan. And, and, you know, there are all sorts of people on the team who are looking to really help in addition to the volunteer teams that are available from McKinsey, Bain, BCG. I mean, there's a real resource there looking at the larger consulting firms. I mean, those are in the tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars in terms of just person hours that they're able to throw at a problem. And to, to the point that each of you has made, you don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars lying around in order to be able to deal with resource pro, you know, or, or infrastructure things. Those don't sell very well when you're talking to the government potentially. How many more kids is this gonna help you see I don't know, it'll just make things smoother, or easier, or faster. Um, that's a tough sell. So we're really happy that it's, it's well received. Um, but so I don't know if either Carol or Darsha wanted to comment on the question that was asked or if you wanted it repeated. Um, if not, I can also say that um, I'm really happy again with the answers. We're into the, what we, I was telling you at the beginning, uh, the last 20 minutes were going to be for Q&A, but I'm really impressed and, and grateful that people who are listening are actually leaning in asking questions that they want to know. Um, Suzanne, so you've given your answer to the question that was asked. Um, Darsha or Carol, did you want to uh, speak to that or did you want me to repeat it? Uh, how sure, do you like no, I, I, I can speak. Um, yeah. I think one of the things that's really, um, really been exciting is, is, is the opportunity for gener generative thinking. And I, I mentioned that earlier on, but when I, I, we've been working with Scott Ng and Clara very closely on our project and also Quentin, but the, 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 the questions that were asked at the on outset of the project has helped us define the project goals. And helped us parse it out because um, sometimes you know in a situation like this you don't have you don't have the opportunity to sit around and noodle well what would I like to know from data and by being asked the right questions and, and doing that generative thinking we've been able to work on our project and work on the timeline and really see the arc of it and and you know things like wait times and understanding and being able to be transparent so I think that opportunity for that generative thinking right at the beginning of the project being asked really good questions having an opportunity to brainstorm and as Suzanne um, uh, alluded to having those weekly check-ins you know we've had Scott and Clara every week they check in and and they've moved the project forward and moved it forward in a way that makes sense for our organization and that's I, I can't express enough how wonderful and important that has been you know I am so incredibly grateful to capitalize for kids and I do just want to say one thing when I joined Rebound seven years ago everyone used to say to me, we do good work. 
And I'd say, but how do we show that? You know, we had no way of showing that we did good work. And now we're getting to a point where we have a we have a way, we have a the the resources and the tools to show we do good work. And that's incredibly important. That's very well said. Thank you. And I'm sure Scott's ears are burning and Clara as well, she, all the adulation, but it's really happy to hear that it's become, it's, it's co-created, it's a co-partnership. It's not like something is done in a black box and three months later, somebody comes back and drops something on your desk. Good luck with it. it it's really working with you along the path and there's buy-in from everybody and everybody agrees what the next steps look like is what, is what I'm hearing from you. I'm thrilled to hear that, frankly. Um, Darsh, I invite you again. I think if you wanted to have a moment to speak to it, if not, that's perfectly fine as well. Great. Yeah, no, for sure. I, I, I think I just echo what Carol and Suzanne say. It, it's a very, it was very easy to, to work, to come in and to work with you and to have um, the skills, the project management skills, Andrew, that you brought to, to our team. So working with Andrew and Clara, and again, um, the resources and the expertise that come from from stepping outside of, even though I came from developmental sector, I'm still in the social service sector. So to have those, uh, to co-create tools with sort of my knowledge of the human side and their business models, it, it was really helpful and, and just excellent project management skills that would have taken me hours to learn or to work through or to build uh, that I just didn't have that was just presented to us each week. And then just the gentle nudging and co-creation of the outcome. So it wasn't me driving and it wasn't Capitalize for Kids driving. We really co-created the end uh, product. Yeah, thank you. Oh, hang on. Okay, good. I didn't do the mute thing. Um, no, thank you very much for the uh, for engaging as well. It really is it's glad to hear there's a uh, a similarity and consistency of experience across a number of organizations. Um, I, I'm having a moment, we have 15 minutes left. Uh, I do feel almost like that moment when people turn on the house lights to expose the audience a little bit. Um, I, I wanna invite the three of you, frankly, because you're, you're spending your days trying to actually affect change for kids' mental health, see more, enable more budget and such. Um, I'd like to really offer the opportunity. Do you have any questions that you would like to know from the audience itself. It doesn't mean they can answer right away that we have the chat sort of system, but we, I hope that we can be that bridge to you know, really connect beneficiaries, people who provide the mental health care, and those who actually wanna see mental health care changes and are able to provide the finance. Anything we can do to facilitate that kind of conversation, I think is only gonna be beneficial. Um, and so I think what I'm hearing, just to make a summation of what I've heard is that um, it's been appreciated to have the, uh, the co-created sort of project management approach that Capitalize for Kids has, to Carol's point about the, the, uh, the generation of ideas, to really get it, the right questions asked so that we're solving for the right problem. Uh, I'm reminded of, you know, uh, measure twice, cut once, or uh, it's been attributed to Einstein as many things have. I spent 85% of my time thinking about the problem, 15% solving it. We want to make sure that we're, we're solving for the right problems. And I, I think there's a really good focus on what it looks like. I wanted to just uh, plant the seed for each of you, Carol, uh, Darsha, and Suzanne. If there's anything comes to mind now or after, things you'd like to know that um, sponsors might be or, or, or donors would be curious to know about what you're doing, the kind of support you're seeking to have. I'd love to get that understanding and sense from you. Um, and with the last 10 minutes, I, I do want to give kind of an, an open sort of uh, mic a little bit to allow crosstalk if decided um, just about how things are going at each other's kind of organizations, what you see as being um, the, the landscape that we're seeing in front of us as we're at the stage now where not only are we getting double vaccination numbers nearing, I mean, there's a certain number it seems are gonna be uh, perfectly resistant to getting vaccination, but we're nearing 100% of those who are gonna be able to be gotten. Uh, children under 11 are gonna be uh, able to get the vaccine. So boosters are being offered and such. Um, I would like to invite the question, how, many, how do you see it changing? Uh, what do you think the landscape looks like going forward? And I'm gonna assume that you don't foresee that uh, kids' mental health is just gonna disappear with the fact that vaccinations are in place. And I've just been interrupted with a question. I'm gonna change things to prioritize this. Um, for the three of you, I'll just put the other question on hold. The question goes, 
Thinking about the respective projects, there have been direct implications, but what indirect outcomes or organizational behavior changes have arisen, if any? Thanks to the, the, the question, the asker of the question. So I've just thrown a lot of talk, two questions of them. One of them is important because it actually came from somebody who was an audience member. So I can repeat it, or if you just need a moment to think on it, uh, let me know how you'd like to proceed. I, I can take a stab at answering that because I, I think there's that, there, that one of the things that's been really interesting. So in human services, everyone uh, wants to care. And, and, our, and I know this will be the same for Suzanne and Darcy's teams. They care deeply about the clients we work with. And so when we talk about things like data and, and or I talk about data and the importance of it and understanding what we do and why we do it, 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 it doesn't really mean anything to a lot of the staff, but we've engaged our team in this. And all of a sudden our team, you know, clinicians are going, oh, this may, I understand this now. Oh, this makes sense. So if I track this, I'll have a better understanding of how I can. So even understanding in the way they work, how quickly we can get to clients, that's making a difference for our whole team. So they under, there, there, there is a general understanding that data and knowledge is, is powerful because it's powerful in, even in the frontline work and the way they're working and how they work. So that's actually been a byproduct that's very exciting. So, and, and to give you a direct result to that, an aha moment came with the team and it came from, you know, looking at how, how long it was from first phone call, literally client calling in to a first appointment. And it was, frontline staff that solved, found the solution to speed that up. And if we'd never had those discussions, we'd never looked at the data, we wouldn't be able to do that. So the, 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 the direct question is, is, is having people on the front line, clinicians, and that's not their main skill set, is think very differently and uh, about those. But understanding it's to support client outcomes. And, and to me, that's exciting. That's a great answer. I'd love to turn it over to Suzanne and Darsha in a second, but the important thing where I liked what you said there specifically, to, and I'll say it very quickly, um, was the fact that this idea that you're not just entering data and it goes into a black hole and it's designed to make your life like a, a circle of Dante's hell or something like that. It's actually driving towards something and that it actually, the right answer, quote unquote, came from the people themselves, the frontline workers. It was them who were now engaged and they knew what the data was about and they were able to propose a solution that was actually the effective and correct one. Uh, it's, a great, it's a great testimonial to it. Um, Suzanne Darsha, if you wanted to, to speak to it at all. I can speak to that a little bit too. Uh, so one of the indirect outcomes definitely was uh, our administrative support. So these children and youth were would have been calling in traditionally. So we would have had someone answering the phone and then they would have gone to an intake appointment. So that took an intake worker up to about an hour. And then there was all the processing time that was included to, to process their documentation and, and get their file going. So we've gone to an online referral where the child and youth tells their own story through that electronic link and it completely skips out processes. So Andrew and Clara were, were able to research with us, what are all the options? And we found that within our own system, it could load it right in. So it decreased all that amount of processing time and administrative support time, as well as intake workers time that was happening just to process these intakes. It's loaded right into our system. They get a text or a phone call saying, here's your first appointment and it's happening within days. The other thing that happened was our frontline staff got so excited about it, all the clinicians, that they, they began working on a brief service regional model that could meet the demand. So we, we had this idea that perhaps if children and youth were able to make their own referral and we were going to skip this huge process to come through into our services, that, that there might be an increase, which there is post-pandemic, um, but also that... Um, the model wouldn't be able, we would cause another backlog because the clinicians wouldn't be able to, to pick up. So we, our clinicians worked on a brief model to meet the demand coming through the door. So that was another uh, outcome and children, so that children and youth can be seen within days now, not weeks of, of making that referral on their own. 
The other thing that I've touched on, which I think is probably the most significant impact is that children who and youth who otherwise were not asking for help or services because they had to go through an adult and not all children and youth have that trusting adult or that relationship with an adult where they feel comfortable to do so. A lot of kids are asked to go through their administration. So talking to your principal or your teacher about your mental health condition in order to get services is, is just not working. So these youth are now, like I said, uh, sending in their own referral, don't have to talk to another adult. And so we just decreased all those barriers. Um, and our intake workers now are able to focus on families with more complex, because often like what's the point of having an intake was kind of what we got to. You're coming in saying that you need help, we're obviously gonna give you help. Where our intake workers can now focus is on other families that have children with more complex needs that need, maybe need more service navigation and coordinating coordination to access our services rather than just uh, a mental health appointment. So those are some of the highlights of, uh, of other indirect outcomes that we've had. Yeah, th that's a great fulsome answer. Do you mind if I share the, uh, it looks, I mean, it's nothing confirmed because we only just launched the referral form recently, but are you, do you mind if we just discuss a little bit of what, what the, the change in the time was, speaking of removing barriers and you know, un unanticipated sort of effects, are you willing to share that kind of data? Just very quickly, and where it was and where, where, where it looks like it's getting to. Yeah, so when you made your call, it could take, uh, we would answer the phone and it could take up to two weeks to get your intake appointment, I believe at the time. We had a project trying to get that within five days. Uh, so we could do that for most of the year, but a lot of the time it was really, it could change and fluctuate. So if we got an increased number of calls, we were two to three weeks out. Another part of the problem was you made a phone call, we called you, we call you for your intake appointment and you're busy. And then it starts again, you're back in, uh, um, families are busy. So you're back into, so it's taking weeks and weeks and weeks just to get this intake appointment. And then from the intake appointment, you were getting your first single session uh, up to a month out. So now you, the children and youth are, or families are making the referral that is picked up instantly by the one intake worker. So we changed our internal structure. They are instantly contacted back to be given their appointment. And that appointment right now is happening within two weeks. Um, but we did also when we launched have a, a big change in staffing up here in the North and about 20 referrals came in that wouldn't have otherwise from our schools. Uh, so it kind of backlogged us, but our hope is uh, through the next month or so, we see a significant increase and we do have a system set up so that when they make the referral, they can see someone within the next day or two. Thanks so much. And um, so I've eaten up a little bit of time. We have three minutes left. Darsha, thanks for the answer, which didn't just say it was better giving some actual numbers around it. And I think that's what we're hanging our hat on. Um, Suzanne, did you want to speak to it? I mean, we have one more question. I don't know if we'll get a chance to even ask it. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll send it to each of you separately if the, uh, if the anonymous attendee is willing to, uh, to wait for a little bit. Sorry that we couldn't get right to your question. Um, did you want to speak to the, uh, the other question that was asked, Suzanne? I was just going to say, wow, Darcy is ahead of us and our system has the ability to do those pieces, but we're just working through some of that process. So I can't wait for us to get there. Um, we had already set up a same day situation that was like uh, that's the turnaround time for that with the pandemic, um, being able to go virtual, but um, the, our our system makes it much easier now because it's all again in, in one place with the telehealth and everything else. So um, I expect that we'll, you know, we'll be right behind you on some of those pieces and I, I can't wait to see what that looks like. Thanks for that. Um, well, uh, we have two minutes left. Uh, it actually went a lot more quickly. I think the abject terror that we started things off with or that I tried to seed in each of you to really destabilize you, I think worked very well. Um, I'm half kidding, but um, I really felt it was a very comfortable conversation, really appreciate the, how much you opened up about the staffing, the impact, how you found working on it. Love the fact there's a little bit of that, of that uh, organizational envy, Suzanne, you're talking about. And yeah, I really think it's the case. Carol's just beginning. Suzanne, you're right. And like, we're, we're starting to see what the problem is. And Darsha's seeing some, some success in the first iterations of potential solutions. So um, we really aspire to do the same thing. Um, I want to uh, myself, again, thank Sarah Beeson for coordinating and pulling all this together. And most importantly, I think beyond our, our panelists who have very kindly been uh, gracious with their, their time to give us an hour of their day, to speak about their organizations in the midst of trying to help people throughout uh, the pandemic. All the people who attended, 
and very much the the engagement that we had from everybody that really made for a very good conversation. I think we were actually discussing things people wanted to hear about. Please let us know what you would like us to to explore for the next virtual cafe. We really want to deliver what's going to make sense. And uh, again, I can't repeat it enough. Carol, Darsha, and Suzanne, thank you so much for sharing with us what's going on at your organization, your expertise, and uh, most importantly, your time. Uh, I think that leaves us with one minute left. So feel free to buy a coffee with the extra minute you've, you've earned back. Um, thanks, everyone, again. Uh, have a great day. Enjoy the sun. And uh, I look forward to speaking with uh, any and all of you as soon as we possibly can. Thank you have so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.